Hello, cinema lovers. We are Cinema Squad coming at you with our latest podcast. Here with me today are my co host, Darren. How's it going, Darren? Hi. It's going good. I saw Tom Hanks land a plane in the Hudson. Okay, that's nice. Hey, that's and, wonderful. And also, Miller. How's it going, my man, Miller? My Miller Lite. What's oh my going God. on, my man? <laughs> it's going good. I'm copywriting that, by the way. I, I came up with that, but, you know, whatever. Also, here is the apparently silent Will. I don't know if he's even still in the call. What's up, Will? What's going on? Heat vision can't melt still beams. Go watch our X-Men... <laughs> Origins Wolverine commentary available now. Also here with me is the silent but deadly Annabella. What's going on, Annabella? <laughs> what is that supposed to mean? That's supposed to mean a lot of things. How? Oh. You're supposed to oh. say what's going on. You know, you're supposed to How say are you going, doing? that it's going bad. <laughs> I think you just called you a ho. That was kind of her what's going on, ho. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Where is this podcast gone? It just started. <laughs> it's gone into the Hudson. <laughs> With Tom Hanks and Eric Hart. And Bushy Mustache. Aaron Eckhart. That was like a porn director mustache. That was an Tell awesome mustache. Oh, yeah. Annabelle, oh, what's going on so we can get started? Say something. Just start. start. I mean, How are you doing, follow. Annabella? I am I'm fine. I'm very tired. Now can we start? Is that good enough for you? Two weeks or something ago, Ben Affleck tweeted out a video of Deathstroke coming out of the Flying Fox in Justice League. Well, we think it's from Justice League. I don't know where it's from. It's probably test footage or something for the Batman movie, whatever. But ever since that, everyone's been wondering who's playing Deathstroke. (laughs) Now we have confirmation on who is playing the iconic orange and blue and black assassin. I hope that's right. Um, (laughs) <laughs> Who's playing Deathstroke? <laughs> it is the it's probably the first widely loved fan cast that has actually happened, and that's Joe Manganiello as Deathstroke. Joe, that's right, people. Joe Manganiello is playing Deathstroke. Boom. Perfect. So, it's perfect. What do you guys think of Joe Manganiello as Deathstroke? What, what I, what I think of. What do I think of uh, Joey M playing um, the it's orange, Joe Manganiello, black, damn it. <laughs> the orange, black, and blue assassin? I want someone. I want Batman to say that in the opening scene. It's like, and he's, it's raining. You orange, black, he's, and blue he's, assassin. Yeah, he's this like, really deep voice. He's holding some guy by his neck. It's just like, where is the orange, black, and blue assassin? <laughs> like, that, that would be great. I'm excited for this. I, I really am. I just... I'm not over the moon about it, but I am glad that we have Deathstroke in the Bruh. universe. He can be, okay. he can be a great foil, an ongoing foil throughout the entire thing. Like, yeah, I hope they don't kill they him ever, in the first movie. Yeah, I hope they don't kill him off either. Because like, if they bring in Titans, Cyborg can have a deal with him. I mean, you can even have like Wonder Woman in in in, 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 in the Injustice um, comic book storyline. One, he and Wonder Woman have problems like. He he's a hitman, and he doesn't he doesn't have any you know morals. If you pay him, he's going to do it. So I, I really hope that he's a ongoing villain throughout this entire thing. <laughs> I, I think he is the perfect choice for Deathstroke because he's really proven himself as an actor. Go watch the Magic Mike franchise to see uh, as some examples <laughs> of that. And he well, physical, the wise obviously he's up to the task. Just imagining him. And Ben Affleck uh, on screen together fighting just melts my brain, to be honest. Annabella, uh, I know you probably don't really know much about it, but what do you think? I agree with everybody else. (laughs) You don't have an opinion on this. It's very wise. Okay, well, me, I have wanted Joe Manganiel. When the rumors first came out back in... Late 2014, early 2015, whenever that Joe Manganiello was playing Deathstroke in Suicide Squad, I went nuts. I was like, yes, 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 yes. Make it happen, DC. Make it happen, please. Then I was so let down when he shut down those rumors and he said, no, that's not even the character I was in talks for. And now that we're having... Ben Affleck, him in Ben Affleck's Batman movie as Deathstroke. I mean, he's a perfect, a perfect casting. And I, 
I cannot wait. The only thing I hope they do, I really hope that they age him and make him sound a little bit older, make him look a little bit older. Since Deathstroke is more like a mid-60s character, Joe Manganiello is only like 38, 39. I'm really happy, though, that uh, Joe Manganiello is taller than Ben Affleck. That was one of my requirements for whoever was playing Deathstroke to be taller than Batman to be taller than Batman, so wow. I think it's perfect. I really don't think the age thing matters that much. Yeah, I don't think the age thing matters either. I don't I don't mind him. I understand where you're coming from because Deathstroke does, in the comic books, he does come off, he, does, he is portrayed as a little older, but, I mean, like I said, I want him in for the long game. He can grow into that older, more grizzled Deathstroke. Just mainly, I just want him to have white hair. That's my main yeah. thing. Okay, yeah, even they could play that at, at an angle of maybe during the super serum experiments. Maybe that's why his hair. That is why was. in the comics. That is why he has white hair in the comics. Oh well, yeah. And there, to be there honest, you I'm fine with him. I'm fine with him just having uh, graying temples like Manu Bennett had. He looked fine okay. as Deathstroke. I don't know. But I I love the casting. This just gets me. A hundred times more hyped for Ben Affleck's Batman movie than I already was. According to Greg Berlanti, Booster Gold will have the Booster Gold movie that is in development that will probably never get made has no connective tissue as he calls it as of yes. to the dc extended universe god that's a stupid move what do you guys think of this i agree i don't really i don't think it's a stupid move i i don't think look either way i don't care whether or not brewster go look could it be cool if he went back in time after say justice league or whatever and he's just like he's seeing all this history with the heroes you know he he, he wants to go back and being rich and everything he knows what happens here and there he can even be a, like an instrument of how Wolverine was in the Days of Future Past, where you're, you know you could send him back in time. He's just like, I know what's coming, Dark Side. Oh my God! You no, know, he could be like something like that. But I mean, I don't mind. I just don't. I don't mind him being on his own. You could put, you can create a booster gold universe where you have C listers and you know, B listers in his universe, and then you can still have the DC universe going on. And there's also the yeah, the multiverse concept. So it's just like I don't I don't mind it I really don't mind it I mean I think it's not all... every single superhero needs to be in a shared universe so yeah it's all stupid and irrelevant until it actually becomes a relevant question like Guardians of the Galaxy for example okay Guardians of the Galaxy has nothing to do with what's happening in the Marvel Cinematic Universe on Earth and to be honest they kind of shoehorned in. Thanos just to connect it for no reason at all. Now, obviously, the Guardians are going to play a big part of the um, Infinity War, and that's fine, that's good, that's great. Then that's when you deal with is it connected to the rest of the MCU is when it actually is important for it to be connected. So at this point, at this point, it's really stupid to say whether Booster Gold is connected or not connected until it actually becomes pertinent as to whether or not it is or is not connected. One thing that's really getting on my nerves is that everybody is saying, oh, well, since it's not connected to the movie universe, that means it's connected to the TV universe. No, it does not mean that. It could, but, yeah, we don't know. <laughs> it, it could, it could. But, again, until Booster Gold shows up on Legends of Tomorrow and he's being played by Nathan Fillion or whoever they cast for it, again, it's completely irrelevant. I also don't think it matters because I don't, I honestly don't think this movie is going to happen. It never seemed like a priority for Warner Brothers to get this movie made and putting it in a separate universe, I think even more reinstates that. Lessens the possibilities yeah. or the chances. Well, and outside, outside of hardcore DC fans, who really even knows who the hell Booster Gold is? That's why I, bar- be on the I barely know who Booster Gold is. I know I love Booster Gold, Gold is, yeah. but like, I mean, he, he I mean, I know too, who he, he should is, be on but TV. am I like, he shouldn't have yeah, him right there. Yeah, I know who he is, but am I, like, you know, an aficionado? Hell no. I love Booster Gold. I'd love to see Booster Gold used. I love the episode they used him in on Smallville. I'd love to see him either used on Legends of Tomorrow, where I think he'll be the perfect fit, or in a movie, or somewhere. I'd love to see him pop up at some point. But the vast majority of the general audience doesn't give a hoot about Booster Gold. Yeah. Can confirm. (laughs) <laughs> I I think he should be on Legends Tomorrow's. I think he should have been on Legends of Tomorrow's originally instead of like Rip Hunter or something. But 
I really don't even get why they haven't used Evil Legend of Tomorrow. Maybe it's just, just because Greg Berlanti wants to do a movie or something. But if they are going to uh, go with the whole separate universe thing, I think it's a, a completely idiotic move because uh, yeah no one really knows who booster gold is or whatever but it's just going to get so confusing it's going to get so confusing with audiences because you have the tv universe and the movie universe and that's already confused some people i mean i i was happy that they separated the tv and the movie universe because i think it it gives more creative choices for the movie universe and the TV universe, keeping them separate. Now, if you're talking about doing a completely separate universe for Booster Gold, and then they're also ta- and then they're also doing Black Lightning on Fox, which is also a completely separate universe, and then they're also apparently talking about doing an HBO Watchmen show, which will also have a completely separate universe, and then they're also talking about doing HBO shows that will be a completely separate universe, and then some HBO shows that will be connected to the DC Extended Universe. And DC doesn't know what they're doing. Yeah, TV and stuff. I I definitely agree because I don't. I think that they should just leave it at the movie universe and the TV universe. If you're going to do TV shows connected to the DC extended universe, do ones that are connected to the DC extended universe on HBO. Leave it there. Ben Affleck just a couple of days ago just dropped his trailer for his new movie, Live by Night, which is a gangster story uh, set in the 20s. It's amazing, to me at least. Annabelle, you just watched it. What are your first thoughts on it? My first thought was that it was going to be pretty badass because I'm pretty sure within, like, the first 30 seconds out of the trailer, like, someone got thrown out of a window, and they're like, I don't know, it looks cool. So. Oh, God, I <laughs> <laughs> then he'll say he wants to come back for the sequel. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe you said that. <laughs> I think it looks yeah, fantastic. I love gangster movies, so I'm I'm all for this. Yeah, I think this looks absolutely fucking incredible. My my reaction will be posted within the next two days. I was jumping up and down, just screaming and yelling. I love this trailer. Everything about it, I am super Watch excited about. This. Super excited about this trailer. I love the music they put behind it. They used the same music they used from the Walking Dead season five trailer. And I mean, he throws a guy down the stairs and shoots and him, while he's, shoot him while he's falling. Come on, how can you can't get any better than that? You know, so it's just this movie looks in the cast: El Fanning, Zoe Saldana, Santa Miller. You got no, Chris Cooper. <laughs> I mean, Chris Cooper, Scott Eastwood, the the incredible talent from Suicide Squad. Such an underrated performance. But um, yeah, it just everything looks so so good in this movie. I think it looks really good, and I'm sure it'll be a great movie. But something about that trailer was off to me. Huh. It looked, it some of it looked like people playing dress up. Huh. Okay, but okay, I, have faith, I have faith in Ben Affleck, and usually the movies that he wrote are better than the ones he just directs. So yeah, that song by Posier or whatever that they play in the trailer, I've listened to that like a hundred times too. Yeah, the song is amazing. Yeah, they they use it pretty well during the actual Walking Dead series. Billy Crudup, a uh, Watchmen actor that played Blue Penis Man in Watchmen, is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Billy concerned. Crudup. What? <laughs> His name in the movie is Doctor Manhattan. But he is naked like half the movie. How great! Well, in, in Dylan's Watchmen comic, every single Doctor Manhattan is marked out by Blue Penis Man. Jesus. Billy Crudup is reportedly returning to the DC Universe. As reported by Variety, he will be playing Henry Allen in Rick from My Way's The Flash movie. I personally say this is a pretty perfect casting. Uh, what do you guys think? I personally do not give a blind flip. I, I just, I don't. Flip? I don't I'm expecting I mean, something more vulgar. Yeah, but, you know, I was trying to go PG. But, um, yeah, you know, look, Billy Crudup is a fantastic actor. I loved him in Watchmen, as you brought up. I loved him in Mission Impossible 3. He he looks a lot. I could definitely buy him as Andrew Miller's father. Look, I don't, I just don't care. I mean, I, like, I don't, I, I don't know if um, Henry Allen has always been um, important to um, Flash's mythos in the comic books, but it's just like, I, I just, I, I really just don't care either. This doesn't excite me. This doesn't kill my excitement for the movie, but it does worry me a tad bit. What? In the way of, in a, just in a, just in a tad bit. 
I just don't want. I, the more I hear, hear about this movie, the more I'm just like, are these? Are they just making a bigger version of the TV show? Or are they doing something different? They have to walk yeah, but, a fine line to make sure that this the movie doesn't just repeat the story beats of the first season of the show. And it's very yeah. likely that Reverse Flash is going to be the villain. Oh my God. Now they're. Uh, apparently the rogues are going to be the villains. So. That that's possible, and if that's true, then that's fine, great, whatever. But it's also very likely that it could be reverse Flash because that's how movies work. That's just my main concern. I want the Flash movie to be everything you can't do on TV. Do it in the movie. We have a great, we have a good movie, series running right now. We don't need to do. You don't need to take what worked on the show. And just make it bigger and more spectacular in the movie. We don't want to see that. Just do something radically do, different. Hire a writer, writer to tell a new, brand new story and give us something. Because The Flash can be a really good movie because of what you can do, what they can do in, in, in a movie. This is just from what I've heard. I don't know if this is true or not. This is just simply what I've heard from people on the internet. From what I've heard, uh, they're, they're doing always, they're doing the they're doing the rogues, but that they will be the new fifty two rogues and they will have powers instead of guns and stuff like that. That's just what I heard. To separate it from the TV show. Yeah, the less I That's care fine, about this movie, but the less I care. Because they've never really, at least not yet, they haven't yet really developed the rogues on the T V series as a cohesive team. You know, whenever they refer to the rogues on the Flash, it's basically just Captain Cold, Heat Wave, Golden Glider. You know, they haven't brought Weather Wizard or Trickster into the oh, actual yeah. rogues team. Oh, so if okay, they're gonna team, if they're gonna do the actual rogues team, that could be interesting, different. But then you also run the risk of is this too many? Is this verging on too many characters for a two and a half hour movie? Or how are you gonna up the ante in the next? Movie. Right, exactly. Which that's, I think they should just what Darren said, or going back to what Darren said about like doing stuff you can't do on the TV show as well. I mean, I know they do this on the TV show, but it's not as good as it could be in a movie. I'd say just say do Gorilla Grodd. That too. So, what does everyone think of the casting or possible casting? I like it. I, think it's great. I, I, I don't care. I think it's great, but I agree with Darren. Where, yeah, my yeah, I'm I don't like Darren. I'm really indifferent about the whole thing because it's not like when John Wesley's ship was cast as Henry Allen, that was monumental just because of his connection to the Flash. To be honest, Henry Allen isn't that big of a character, so who cares? Yeah, which, which to the show's credit, that was one of the, the, one of the best parts of the entire first season were the scenes between here and Henry and Barry, but I don't want to see that repeated yeah. and molded into a film, so... John and Grant did so well and were so emotional in those scenes that the movie couldn't possibly do it better. So just leave it yeah. alone. Yeah. I think the movie will, I think they'll probably do something. They'll probably do something like leave his mom alive, leave his parents alive or something. Hopefully. They, I think that'd be better. And they can't so. because prior to Jeff Johns's uh, Flash Rebirth, prior to that, that was the story. Jeff yeah, Johns was no, all of that. All of that into the flashes bashes story. Next topic, according from from the special features of X Men Apocalypse from Brian Singer, Mister Sinister will be a villain in Wolverine Three. What do you guys think of this? Who would you like to see play Mister Sinister? I'm excited for it because of I'm excited for it, but it's it just goes back to the also the. The Flash thing, in a way, we've seen what Singerverse will do to. Because the more the more I am discovering, I like the X Men films, I do. But the more I am discovering, the more I'm finding out that the X Men lore is so deep and rich, and what we got in the movies isn't really that. And and Mister Sinister is this crazy genetics obsessed. He's obsessed with the Gray Bloodline and everything. And I don't think we're going to necessarily get that in the movie. But yeah, I mean, I'm in, I'm excited to see, and also I'm afraid of what they're going to do to him visually, because he's a cool looking villain. But I don't know how they're going to translate that into into the movie. But yeah, I mean, I want to see what they have to do with it, do with him 
he'll be a cool villain for Wolverine to fight because he can't really he he can regenerate like you can't really kill him just like Wolverine. So I mean, it'll be a cool villain, and also maybe that finds a way to bring in X twenty three. So you know, it'll, it, I think it'll be a cool addition to Wolverine, whatever the movie's going to turn out to be. Well. Uh, Darren brings in a good point that Mr. Sinister is more of an X-Men villain, not a Wolverine standalone villain. His connection in the comics isn't really even to Wolverine. It's to Jean Grey and Cyclops and Cable. Okay? So it would be it would make much more sense to save him for the next X-Men movie, not the next Wolverine movie. That yeah. said... Uh, Richard E. Grant is casted as an unnamed mad scientist role that could very well fit the Mr. Sinister character. So it would be very interesting to see Richard E. Grant play that character. Uh, and with a name like Nathaniel Essex, he just screams being British. And, uh, and yeah, again, I'm also curious, I wouldn't say concerned, but curious as to what they're going to bring to him visually. Is he going to be Mr. Sinister, or is he just going to be some mad scientist named Nathaniel Essex? With a dot on his head. It's a diamond, not a dot. It's a red diamond. Uh, uh, burn. <laughs> this, this news makes me more... I mean, I, first of all, I think I find it weird how, it, how this news came out just from the commentary, but whatever. <laughs> this news makes me more interested in this movie because literally take out that this is Hugh Jackman's final movie and I couldn't care less about this movie. I I actually have to agree with Miller. Yeah, but, I, mean, I think I, I think it'll be a, he'll be a good villain. As to who I cast as him, I don't really have an opinion. I mean, I know Brian. Brian Cranston. Cranston. I'm getting tired of people saying Brian Cranston for every villain role. <laughs> like, yeah, me too. He's a great actor. I'm just kidding. Oh I mean, yeah, he just said he wanted to play him, and I'd like to see him. Brian play Cranston says he wanted to play like three villains, and he hasn't done a cast in any one of them. Brian Cranston should be a villain in some comic book movie. He should have been Lex Luthor. But... No. I think it's safe to say, and people only say Lex Luthor because he was bald in Breaking Bad. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, no, I say Lex Luthor because he'd be great as Lex Luthor. And he probably very well could be great as Lex Luthor, but again, like what Miller said, I'm getting sick and tired of hearing his name brought up for everything just because he was in a successful TV series. Mr. Sinister, what does everybody think? Overall? Yes, no, um, maybe so. Yeah. Sure, why not? Cool. I don't really want to see X-23 used in the third Wolverine movie just because, well, it makes sense that they would use her in the Wolverine movie, but if this movie is being as set as far in the future as people are saying, which maybe it won't, but Hugh Jackman has used the words the far future, okay? So maybe it won't be that far in the future, but I would hate to see them waste that character in a capacity where she can't be used again in a future X-Men team film. That is my entire problem with this entire movie. Because even if you, as you said before, Sinister is more of an X-Men villain. If you introduce him in this movie, how the hell is he going to appear in any of the other movies? And then X-23, I want X-23 to take over for Wolverine. I, I'm, I'm a proponent for that. No, but you, right. well, and you also have to that. Think the post credit scene for X-Men Apocalypse was for was teasing Mr. Sinister, and that movie's set in like the 70s or something, so yeah, they'll figure you, it out way. But Essex, Essex has been able to age and survive for a very long time. So he could be alive in the future. He hasn't changed. Essex Corp could be around for, I mean, Essex Corp could have been around for hundreds of years. Right, but you create X-23, say, 30 years in the future, and then still have her be a teenager in the 90s. No, I know. I'm just talking about Mr. Sinister. I'm not talking about X-23. Yeah, I mean, and she doesn't age, so she's like Wolverine. Right, right but she can't appear She can't appear before she was ever created. That's my point. That is but, true. I mean, yeah. we'll, we'll see. Either way, if they are using X-23, though, she's replacing Wolverine. To be honest, I think All New X-Men was probably Brian Michael Bendis' best work, and I love the way they used her on that team, and I loved I would just love to see X-23 used in an X-Men team film, not just a throwaway character in a Wolverine film, which is kind of what it seems like they're going with. Yeah, cuz I mean, X-23 even her newest um her recent run in comic books is brilliant. It's really really good. Are you talking about All New Wolverine? Yeah, it's really good. Everyone's good with Mr. Sinister being the villain of Wolverine 3. I don't think that's Next what we up. said. What? 
I said, I don't think that's what we said, but okay, I'm cool go on. I don't really care. I don't care about the theory. I think that's what we said. Who? Okay, who didn't say that? I think we're just iffy. I'm, we're, 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 I'm good with it. As long I'm as you're actually Mr. Sinister and not just decision. Nathaniel at Essex. Anyways, okay, some people are not good with Mr. Sinister being the villain, and some are. So there you go. I think everyone, what, everyone but Annabella, I think, has seen <laughs> Sully. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, yeah. So everyone but Annabella has seen it. So what did everyone think of it? I really, really liked it. It was all right. I, I, I really, really liked it. I, I got to say, um, we were, we've been talking about this for a while. Um, Will's been singing the praises. Me and you have been very, um, me and Dylan have been very like, this looks like a Lifetime movie. Me too. And, um, yeah, we will and Miller too, but it's, um, I, I liked it. It's a great story of the human condition of survival of, you know, coming together and, and trying to get out of this situation. And also, about post-traumatic stress, about what both... And I love how they represented not only Sully, but also Jim. Like, I... Oh, Jeff. Jeff. They also represented, represented Jeff. Aaron Eckhart was great. He was a great yeah. comic relief. You also you also saw the strain in him. You know, that, one, that Snickers line, I can't believe they have a $5 Snickers. I mean, that, that was... <laughs> that was great. I mean, and also the plane crash. I mean, not the plane crash, the water <laughs> line. <laughs> The water landing was great. It was a the great plane thing crash. Was great. <laughs> yeah, all those died, well, man. It's just like a, a head flew out of the building. Was, that's not. <laughs> I wish that happened. Um, when the, they had the dream sequence at the beginning. In 3D. But, I also uh, love that this wasn't just a disaster movie. That yes. it was. Uh, the majority of the movie wasn't even about the actual event. It was about the aftermath of the event. And how the characters dealt with it. And I really enjoyed that. I was not expecting that. From the trailers, I thought it was going to be, you know, the lead up and then the climax was going to be the actual event. But um, I was pleasantly surprised to see that it wasn't that. And in even the event, like, you would expect it because they showed it really early. And you expect, okay, this is going to get boring eventually. Never got boring from all the angles they filmed it from. It never got boring, and um, ladies and gentlemen, our listeners, this isn't a spoil. None of these are spoilers because this actually happened. But um, yeah, it's seeing um, showing enough. it from showing it from even showing it from a, the um, the passengers' perspective, that was brilliant as well. Um, you know, you got to see what it was like inside of the plane. You got to see what it was like inside the um, cockpit. It was it was just a really good. Well, look, is is it perfect? No, I feel like the movie literally stops dead in the middle but then it saves itself by by um the uh, the um ending but um yeah i, I really liked sully I, I really really liked it i just thought it wasn't very tasteful that they released it they released it what this thursday this friday i think that's fine yeah yeah i, didn't think I think they released... it was very tasteful though but i think the reason i did, it, thought it was um tasteful is because if you watch this movie it's a nice juxtaposition to what happened, what the tragic events that happened on um, 9-11, because you, you get to see people coming together. You get to see a plane, thankfully, landing safely in New York without, you know, there being any, any casualties or anything. Yeah, and and I think that's a good thing to see. Good point. And I agree with that, but I also see where Annabella was coming from, because I thought the same thing while I was watching it. Uh, just because of some of the daydreams that uh, that Sully has throughout the film and the ways he envisioned how it could have gone bad, um, a lot of that I was thinking, mm, man, I don't personally find it objectionable, but I could easily see how other people are going to. Uh, yeah. But so far nobody has, so maybe that's yeah, me yeah. overthinking stuff. Yeah, the movie did great at the box office. I liked the movie. I, I really, really liked the movie a lot. I saw it in IMAX, by the way. If you're Same afraid here. of flying, do not see the, this movie in IMAX. <laughs> if you do not see this movie in IMAX, you're doing yourself a disservice. I agree. Yeah, you are. But um, the movie the movie is great. Uh, Tom Hanks gave a great performance. Aaron Eckhart gave a great performance. But I will say one of, one of the things, well, even though I like the movie, but I think the main – the main thing 
it, it's not necessarily a flaw in the movie. I guess it's more of a flaw maybe in the script or something. But if it wasn't for Eastwood directing, I don't think the movie would have been near as good as it was. I see what you mean, yeah. Mm. Just because of, like, how he films the plane crash, like, that could have easily, like Will was saying, he thought that the movie was going to build up to the build up to the uh, plane landing, and then uh, the plane landing would be the climax, and then it would go down from there. But uh, the way that the plane landing was filmed was what made it so interesting, because you saw it from the passenger's point of view, and you saw it from other people in the city's point of view, and you saw it from uh, Sully's point of view. I mean, you saw it from, like, everyone's point of view, and that's what made it so interesting. And if it wasn't for that, it just it wouldn't have been as gripping and as powerful as it was. Yeah, I agree with that. And I do kind of like that the trailers give you a little misdirection in that area because they still make you want to see the movie. They still make the movie look interesting. But then when you go in and you actually sit down, like from the very beginning, you don't know where this movie is going for a few minutes. And then you finally catch on. You're like, oh, this is the movie they're making. Okay, got it. Yeah, because, I like, at first, thing. you know, the opening shot, you think they're showing the uh, the plane crash. And at first I'm like, is this going to be one of those movies where they open up with the end and then blah, blah, blah. But it wasn't that at all. I'm really glad how they did the op- – I'm really happy with how they did the opening of the movie. It yeah. scared the hell out of me. Like, it had, the only thing, <laughs> it had me sweating. My, pro- my problem with it is people are laughing when I saw it. And I'm just like, what the fuck is wrong with you people? That's what you happened when I like, saw Don't Breathe. Yeah, I was just like, why, why, Jesus why are Christ, people laughing? People. Yeah, but, I mean, even the... Um, in that in that movie, in, in the screening I saw, it, that movie earns its um, uh, um, of ovations. It, it, it earns its applause. Because it, it, it is a truly human story. And that's what I really like about it. I saw it with, like, a few old people, so nobody was laughing in my theater. Yeah, definitely, definitely see this movie in IMAX if you do want to see it. It scared the shit out of me when I saw it in IMAX because I don't like flying. But Yeah, I'm going on a plane ride. If you don't want to see it, change your mind. Yeah, I'm going on a plane ride in a few weeks, so I'm going to have fun. Next up... Uh, we've got our box office report. Sully came in first place with 35.5 million in its weekend, in its uh, first weekend, and then the critically panned "When the Bow Breaks" scored a. Unfortunately, did actually did okay over the weekend uh, with 15 million, and it had a pretty small budget of 10 million, so it made it a pretty decent weekend. In third place, "Don't Breathe" brought in 8.2 million. Uh, in fourth place, Suicide Squad brought in 5.6 million, and it also crossed 700 million worldwide and 300 million domestically. And then in fifth place, the animated movie The Wildlife flopped with 3.4 million on a 13.5 million budget. Who could have saw that so, coming? <laughs> yeah, no one saw that coming. Uh, anyways, what do you guys think of this? What do you guys think of these numbers? What are your predictions for next week? Sully, good job, man. Good job. Land that plane, brother. Um, <laughs> when the bow breaks, um, fuck. Look, the only good thing about that movie is that girl that's on the poster. Because, wow. But anyway, <laughs> that, 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 any, any other thing about that. That movie looks like every other fucking movie that's ever fucking happened. Yeah. Oh, we're going to have a baby together. Oh, wait. Let's give it to this girl. Oh, wait. Bitch is crazy. Oh no! So you know, it's just like it looks like a lifetime movie. Well, it they actually like had they actually had a lifetime movie with Kristen Wiig and Will Ferrell that has a very similar. I think yeah, I know it's yeah. like the same exact plot. Oh. But yeah, don't breathe. Good, good for you. I mean, yeah, don't breathe. Thank you for sticking in there. Thank you for scaring us for two weeks straight. It was great. Suicide Squad. Congrats. Suicide Squad. Congrats <laughs> to you, man. You know, let's go go commit suicide. And I mean. Uh, uh, wild the wildlife, um, yeah, Great the job. wildlife. Fuck you, wildlife. Um, I tried to recover from that. There is no way. Did you watch the wildlife? No, I said I tried to recover from that joke, but there is no way. Oh, that trailer Dude, looked that, good. In 3D but, oh. when I saw it too, though. The trailer did not look good. The oh, trailer made me. I thought in three D it looked good, but the movie looked awful. Yeah. Oh, I know. I just. But also, I just wanted to point out, um, Hell or High Water is in the top ten, so. That's good, but all but good. predictions, yeah, predictions for uh, next week. 
I believe Blair Witch is coming out next week. Yes. So yeah, Blair Witch will probably take first. I hope it does because I got to see it. That's the first movie I've been absolutely frightened by. Like I, I don't know, I don't exactly know what happened in the last fifteen minutes because I was looking down at the floor. So <laughs> definitely I want to see it, but one. I don't have anyone to see it with me. <laughs> Annabelle, uh, excuse me, I don't want to be terrified. Well, I think Blair Witch has. A uh, very good shot of being number one next week just because it's got the name recognition. And, uh, you know, and if, if it's actually good, um, that, that will do a lot for it. I also think that uh, Sully might actually have a chance to do two weeks in a row at number one just because I think word of mouth is going to be very strong about it. But I might be giving that movie too much credit. It was a great movie, but, you know, we'll see. I think... Blair Witch will do well. I, yeah, probably number one for that. And I also think, I don't know, I feel like Snowden could go either way. I don't, I f- sort of feel like that's my Snowden's going to flop. I'm calling it right now. And then I think Bridget Jones will do well also. Oh, yeah, that is coming out next week. That probably will do well. It looks fun. And next up, we've got a discussion topic. We haven't done these in a while, but uh, what is everyone's favorite director? Darren, like of all of, of all oh, time. Okay, um, oh, you mean of all time, or just like recently? Yeah, what's, who's your favorite director? Okay, I'm not going to say of all time because I have no idea. I I appreciate it. even if you make a bad movie, there's good things finding it. But um, yeah, my favorite director as, as of now is definitely Matthew Vaughn. Uh, it has it just it, I love the stories he tells. He can tell a big big budget story with still actually relying on story. Um, I love his wit, his, um, you know, his writing plot partners, Jane Gold- Goldman and um, Zach Pence. Wait, no. Old Jane Gold- Goldman. Um, she, she's a fantastic screenwriter. Um, Kick-Ass. I love Kick-Ass. I love St- Stardust. It's the closest I think we will ever get to The Princess Bride. Um, X-Men First, First Class was a breath of fresh air, uh, a breath of fresh air that franchise desperately needs again. And Kingsman, The Secret Service was my favorite movie of last year. I love, you know, I love his, his, you know, you, he always has a, uh, someone who's trying to come out of someone else's shadow and they succeed by doing that. And I just love, I love his direction He he can be dark, he, but he can also have levity and laughs and he's not afraid to, you know, go to a really fucked up place, but it's still enjoyable the entire time, the entire time you're um, going on the ride. So yeah, definitely Matthew Vaughn. I, I love Matthew Vaughn. Okay. Miller. I would probably say Wes Anderson. He's a director that continues to perfect his craft. I would say out of his films, uh, Grand Budapest Hotel is probably my favorite. But I appreciate some directors, and Wes Anderson is one of those directors that falls under that, is that they, they're they able to make a movie with a similar type of style that they have in all their movies, but they don't. it doesn't end up feeling like the same type of movie, which I think Wes Anderson pulls off really well. And it's just, he feels, I mean, all his movies look like, like just take one shot from them and they look like a painting and he fills them with such wonderful and unique characters played by great actors. And I just think, yeah, I just think he's a director that has continued to uh, gotten better he sees what works about his movies and keeps on improving it. And I'm excited to see what he does next. Okay. Well, well if we're doing favorite directors of all time, then I'm going to go old school and I'm going to say Hitchcock because Hitchcock, one, he was able to see the beauty and the story of certain things that most studios wouldn't have Like, okay, without Hitchcock, Psycho never gets made into a movie because that was kind of a cheap, you know, dime store novel. It it flew under the wire. That would have never been made into a movie if Hitchcock had not been as visionary as he was. Plus, his antics with buying up every copy of that novel so that nobody would be able to know how the movie ended. And not only that, but Hitchcock had a very uh, interesting visual style. The opening to the movie Vertigo is still one of the best, uh, the best shot uh, opening scenes or you know introductory scenes or whatever of any film. So yeah, I'm definitely going to go Hitchcock. 
That's a good choice. Cool. Uh, North, just going back, like Miller, definitely Grand Budapest Hotel is my favorite West Anderson. I mean, I, it took me a while to get on get on board with him because when I first saw Moon or I see you in the kingdom, I was just like, change the fucking camera angle. But I appreciate it. You know, <laughs> I appreciate it. You said that was hilarious. <laughs> I, I appreciate it now, and Grand Budapest Hotel is near genius. And um, for Will, Alfred, Alfred Hitchcock, um, North by Northwest is amazing. Yeah, that's one of the greatest one of the greatest suspense movies ever made. I agree. Yeah, and this and the score. The yeah, feeling. the score's fantastic. And, and Hitchcock just had a way of being able to put all the because that's what a director does. A director assembles a puzzle. And Hitchcock was very good about making sure all the pieces were in place and they they were the right pieces that fit there. Since I became a film fanatic or since I started journeying into film criticism or whatever, my favorite director, and yeah, this is yeah, this is my favorite director. Uh, Christopher Nolan has always been my favorite director. So I just I love. Just the way he makes his movies, I mean, it's just, he, he's just amazing. Probably second place would probably be Ben Affleck. He's a close second, but yeah, Christopher Nolan is who I well, would and go Christopher with. Nolan, Christopher Nolan is a brilliant director, and I would hate for, as wonderful as his Batman movies were, I would hate for that to be the thing that he's remembered for, just because, you know, he's done so many fantastic movies, and when he was first when he was first announced as the director of Batman Begins, I thought that's that's perfect because who better than a director that makes psychological thrillers to understand Batman? And he really did understand Batman in a fundamental level. But beyond that, you know, uh, Insomnia is one of my favorite movies, and I think he just the. I mean, the, the cinematography in that movie, the filters that he used in Insomnia were great for setting that gloomy, snowy, Alaskan tone. And, and I agree. I, Christopher Nolan's brilliant. Yeah, Christopher Nolan is, is fucking brilliant. Like, there's no, there's no doubting it. He is absolutely brilliant. I, I mean, Dunkirk, it's a one-minute trailer that I've watched over and over and over again because – you just feel the hype, and every single time he's done sci-fi, you're excited for him to do sci-fi. Even if his movies aren't perfect, he's just brilliant. He also, you know, he and he brings back the idea of practical effects. He knows how to, even the darkest of times that that are in the Dark Knight trilogy, he knows still how to how, how to bring the levity and the comedy and the jokes. Because he, like, the cops in the in the Dark Knight trilogy are the best superhero movie cops ever. Because <laughs> just like how how they respond, he's flying on a rooftop. <laughs> like, you know, it's just that stuff is great. So yeah, and and what he's done with with the Batman mythos, with the Dark Knight, and and Batman Begins. I didn't like Dark Knight Rises that much, but it, but he capped off the trilogy in a brilliant way. So Nolan is definitely definitely one of the great. And he's going to prove people wrong about Harry Styles. So and he's not being a good actor. Anyways, guys, thanks for listening. Make sure you like us on Facebook at Cinema Squad. Make sure you follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Cinema underscore Squad. Make sure you visit our website, CinemaSquad.com.